And uh, when I was here as a student, we were over at the ten or over the building over by the administration building. And during that time in the business school, there was only two lectures that came in. And I was hungry for the outside uh, real life experience. Because of that, whenever I'm asked to come down here, and this is actually my third time in a different department speaking down here this year, I always come. At other universities, it's just the same. Whenever a student's involved and I can share experience, <clears throat> that's when I want to come and be with you. So today, I've, I've titled this, <clears throat> get it up? Uh-oh, technical problems, kind of like the Super Bowl yesterday, I guess. At least we have light. I've titled the, uh, the topic here, and we can keep going, is uh, Living the Dream. How many of you feel like right now you're, you're living the dream? Any of you? Good. I hope you do. I hope you do. There's about 7,000 students last year that were turned away from BYU. And you're here. Does that mean you have an obligation and a responsibility? I think it does. Back when I was here, I grew up in Payson just down the road. And we had kids on our football team that came over here. And they had like 17 on their ACT. They probably only stayed a year. But it was a warm body could get in. Most of us today, including of any age, probably would not be here today. You guys have. I've uh, been given blessings of skills and talents that uh, allowed you to be here uh, that a lot of us wouldn't. So it's a good thing we were born when we were born, right? Sometimes that dream becomes a nightmare. <laughs> and the question is, what do we do when it's a nightmare? It's not always an easy road. Life is not an easy road, is it? Hasn't been for me, and still doesn't continue to be. There's still a lot of challenges that come along with it. How many of you are here because you want to be an entrepreneur? A lot of hands, good. How many of you feel like you know what that means to be an entrepreneur? A few of you. There's two kinds of, of entrepreneurs. And I can't remember what order I have all this without the slides, so I, I may have to flip the order in here. One of the, the kind that I happen to be is visionary. How many of you feel like that, that you don't like to work for somebody? A few of you? All right, well, <clears throat> that's one of the signs of being a, a visionary type of entrepreneur. Because maybe I can be helped, can I? I'm using these up here. There's that function right there. This is too old for you, huh? It should be. I should be bringing it up. I right. there you're almost there. The problem is it's not talking to the projector. Oh. Okay. A visionary entrepreneur can see where you want to be. You want to know where you want to get to. But we're not very good at getting there. My ideas and things about how we should have built our stores and how we should have distributed, how we should have done those, they weren't near as good as the people that I hired to actually do them, to do those tasks. But I also found that there was two kinds of entrepreneurs inside of my organization. There was me, and then there was the rest. These were people who had a lot of experience. My COO that I hired had been the, C CO, the number three guy at Mervyn's department stores. Now, they've gone out of business since then, but it's now Target Corporation. They were a lot like Kohl's. Had a lot of fashion experience, a lot of store experience. But he also could take a project and think about it outside the box. 
And I would suspect that there's a lot of you that may fit this second category more than the first. But any organization that will allow you to be entrepreneurial, you can be an entrepreneur inside of a, a multinational company if they'll let you. The government's not very good at it. Even the church as an organization, as a business organization, is not very good at it. But there are great organizations that allow people to be entrepreneurial. So when you're looking at what you want to do, I think it's really important that you've sat back and analyzed what kind of entrepreneur you are. Is this something that you teach here, Scott? Is this this concept? It is? Good. Okay, so I won't go too much longer on it. I've also found that when I was here at school and, and beyond, that I had two sets of skills. Uh, my, my major was finance, and then I also took some construction management because I was doing real estate stuff at that, but I also had an interest in marketing. Well, unbeknownst to me at that time, because my dad was a seminary teacher and our family didn't have a lot of money, if I was going to get any money to start anything or do anything, I had to go raise money. So when I combine those two things of marketing and finance, I've spent a lifetime raising money. It, it, it applied during the Romney campaign last year. I spent a lot of time helping raise money there, uh, raising money for, for nonprofits, raising money for our companies. That is a skill that I have had and have been able to take across many different industries. Back there, Franklin Covey is one industry. All the dollars, another industry. Narchi is another industry. Content Watch is another industry, and all of the charities are various uh, focuses. So one of the questions I ask you is, what are your core competencies? You know, companies have them, but so do people. And, people, and you have to decide what is your core competency, because the industry you go into is not as important as how you know how to use the skills that you have and how to develop them. That's the important part. Now, the last part of this is how many of you, may you don't, I may not get a lot of hands on this, how many are doing this because they want to make a lot of money? Okay, how many are doing it because that's your primary reason? There's nothing wrong with raising money or with making money. That's a good thing. But if that's the primary reason, how many doctors would you want to go to if their primary purpose of going to medical school was the money they were going to make? You've got to be happy and like what you're doing. And if, if, if you're forcing, if this is a round peg in a square hole, you know, don't keep forcing it. Find, find that area in life that you can be happy in because it's a, it's a, a long life and a short life uh, that you have to live. One of the things that set my a foundation for me in my life was a realization as a missionary that came to me. How many of you served missions? A lot? A bunch? You remember those times that the general authorities would come and visit your mission and you'd have question and answer sessions with them? Do you have those in your mission? Well, I had one of those experiences. I was in England, and President Hinckley came when he was a member of the Twelve. And I was one of those missionaries. I was a district leader at the time. And I really wanted an angel to come, or I wanted a vision to tell me right where to go to this house. And I'd spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out with maps and things where I was supposed to be going. And I would, I would get what I thought was a good plan and nothing would come out of it. <laughs> and I, I was getting kind of frustrated. And so in this session with President Hinckley, I asked him the question, how do you know whether the path you're on is the one you're supposed to be on or if it's just your own thinking? And this is what he said. And I will tell you in advance that his son Richard worked with me at Content Watch. And he, 
as we talked about President Hinckley and his philosophy, this is how he ran the church as well. And as I sat with him 20 years later at dinner and asked him what he thought of this council, he said even more so. This is what he said. Get on your knees, get the best answer you can, get up off your knees and go to work. Leaving yourself open to course correction. That's the key. President Hinckley, is, when he was running the church, he was a second counselor in the first presidency. And the president of the church at the time was sick. So was the first counselor. There was a decision made by the first presidency, which the only the one functioning was President Hinckley at the time. And he made the deci- they made the decision to shorten the missionary time from two years to 18 months. Any of you know that? Maybe some of your dads were even in that situation. You're about that age. Well, it didn't work very well. (laughs) So they changed it back. That, to me, is an example of course correction. Or you think you want to go into one industry, the doors don't open, you end up in another industry, but you're still using your skill set to be able to accomplish the things that you want. I don't. I am sorry. I can, you know, if I need... Do I just do this? (laughs) I'm sorry to make things so hard. When I was asked by my former partners at Franklin to get involved with Content Watch, I said, I'm the lowest tech guy you can find. I've been selling stuff for a buck for 15 years. <laughs> but yet, it was the right thing to do. And, and uh, so I, I did it. I've been doing it. Um, in the process of, of this pathway, I've also learned what, what frustration means. And it, I'd like you to, to, if you don't want to take time now to read it, but in the third section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 1 through 3, it talks about the Lord's uh, plan never becoming frustrated, only man's work becoming frustrated. And what I found when it reaches the point of frustration in my own life is that either if I'm frustrated, feeling feelings of frustration, I'm either out of line or out of of mind. Either my mind or my actions are out of line with God's. So if we're trying to to do things in life that are leading to the points of frustration, stop. Take a look at it and see what you're doing that you could do differently to take it down that path, a better path. Uh, In 19... 89, I was on a trip with my son, who is now a BYU MBA grad. He was 12 years old. We were in a, in a shopping mall in New Orleans, and I saw a dollar store for the first time. And I was on a trip for Franklin. So the idea came to me, and this is also a sign of a visionary entrepreneur, is the world's a candy store. You can always see ideas and things to do. So I thought, you know, that would be a great project to bring back to Utah because there's nothing like it around here. So I came back, and, it, and I did a lot, a lot of research. I started going to trade shows where the, where the sourcing, where the products would come from. I started meeting CEOs of other small dollar companies around the, the country, and they started to give me, answer my questions what percentage should you be paying in rent? What percent should you be paying in labor? What, what should your, your things cost? We're going to go quite a ways down the road here. How do I get it down? Okay. This was a grand opening of a store. 
Now it helps when you when you sell TVs. We had ten of them. We would sell for a dollar. You had to get in line, and we we finally found when we started getting the police coming on fights. <laughs> Uh, we had to change the way we organized how people got in the store. But uh, we had the first hundred people in the store had great things that they could buy for a dollar. And the first ten each got a TV for a dollar. So it, it, it drew a lot of attention, got a lot of excitement. And what our idea there was, we really wanted to get people in the store. Because once they were in the store, they'd realize they weren't coming there because things were for a dollar. They were coming there because there were things of value. And the shopping experience was part of that value equation as well. So part of our research took me around the country. A Dollar Tree ended up purchasing us a number of years later. But I started talking to CEOs and uh, other people in their company about what made the business work. And Dollar Tree today is about a six or seven billion dollar company. And at the time that I first met them, they just had a, uh, about 300 stores. And in fact, they had less than that. They had about uh, 60 or 80 stores. And they're out of Virginia, and they, they just kept growing and growing, and then they went public, and then they started acquiring companies, and uh, they're, the, they're the big gorilla today. So we had our vision, we did our planning, and then we found the best people that we could find because I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. I had to find people that did. That was our first press release that actually got published. <laughs> this is an example of how things can start out complicated and get simple. This was our first logo. And it's not unlike the first logo that we used at Franklin on the day planners. We had a picture of Franklin and stuff underneath. and it, You know, it, that's a pretty hard logo to duplicate. And it, I got my first awakening when I went to, the, to our first store planning and zoning meeting with the city of Sandy, and they said no. I mean, I was devastated. We'd put all this time and effort into this great logo, which I, as if logos actually sold anything. Uh, we didn't get it passed. And, so we simplified it, and we ended up with all a dollar, <laughs> just on its own. And it's amazing how those things that you don't plan on just become simple and, and move you ahead. That was our first store in Sandy. And honestly, I still didn't know what I was doing, but I'd hired a guy who'd been a national buyer for Albertsons. He'd been with Sam Skaggs' organization, et cetera. And he, was, he did know what he was doing. So we had the store all organized and ready to open. And he just over, went over and opened the door, and people started coming in. I said, no, we're not ready to open. He said, yeah, we are. So people started coming. We opened in August, and we did so well. Immediately, it was profitable. And we had another store open before Christmas in West Valley. That was the store before we started. That was the store after we finished. And I even painted that stripe in the walls. I, 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 we went and found used fixtures uh, and cleaned them all up, got them repainted, <laughs> and, and put them in the stores because we didn't have enough money to, to be able to go buy new stuff. But it, it worked. It worked well. Some of our cutesy stuff we tried eventually. I mean, it didn't take long to drop all of these kinds of things, too. We even had a grand opening party for the bankers and everybody with George and Martha there. Had some fun. This was our first warehouse. Well, this is part of the old Bennett Paint property in Salt Lake on 21st South and 3rd West. That's another story. We needed a warehouse. Uh, the banks had foreclosed on this property, but yet they didn't dare touch it because they thought it was a super fun site. They had all this toxic waste in it. I happened to have a very close friend and neighbor, who was in our bishopric, who was the state director of environmental health. And I went to Ken and said, Ken, what should I do here? And he said, I'd buy it. So we went to the banks, and we bought seven prime acres on 21st South out of foreclosure for $200,000. <laughs> 
it was supposed to cost seven or eight million to clean it up. It ended up costing about a million, of which Office, Office Depot, I think it is, paid to have the cleanup done. And there's a shopping center there now, and that's where they wanted to be. So they helped pay for it to get it done. I don't own any of that shopping center anymore because my partner that started with me, I used part of that, that equity, or I used the equity we had in the property to buy him out of, of the stores. And he was mainly into real estate. But this was a 10,000 square foot building behind the glass building. My kids used to love to go down and throw rocks at those glass windows and scare the transients out. <laughs> We actually had a uh, March of Dimes Halloween uh, haunted house in there one time, too. This is what we ended up with at the end. This was a 510,000 square foot building out by the airport and with our own fleet of trucks. And uh, it, it was just amazing, the distribution system that was developed. But it took a, we had to move warehouses several times in that process. And keeping it financed was was another story. And, and after we had proven ourselves, uh, we had about five years, we had about 12 stores, and we brought in a Apex Partners from New York. They became our, our equity partner. And uh, they were great to work with. So that's how, that's how we grew to 24 stores. And so, sorry, I thought I had that turned off. Do you have to buy pizza in this class when your phone goes off? <laughs> That's how it goes in some meetings. <laughs> in our companies, you know, if they go off at the wrong time, they bring pizza to the next one. We had, in 1997, that seems like a long time ago, and it was 10 years ago we sold the company, but we had, we had three elephants to digest. And you've heard of elephants. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well, it's enough to, to eat one elephant, but it's, it's, not, it's even more to eat three at, at the same time. So one of the things that I learned in this process is starting the company was hard, but getting through the middle ground of growth was even harder. It was where the highest risk was, was the middle ground. So we decided to grow from 15 to 24 in one year. So we had to go hire nine store managers, a couple of district managers, get the store sites, get them built out, increase the inventory, so it doesn't sound like a lot, but it was, you know, it was like a 60%, 70% growth that one year. It put a lot of stress on the organization. We had to move our warehouse twice in 14 months. Now, when you think about it, the average store that we had at that time did about $1.8 million in sales. But that probably represented about 2.5 to 3 million items that had to flow through that store. And they all had to go through the warehouse for the most part. It was millions of... We, our sales were like $170 million when we sold. And you can imagine the amount of volume uh, that that took to, to make it happen. And we ended up with a new operating system that was supposed to be working in July. Finally got operating the end of October. And over Thanksgiving, we discovered it didn't work. We had absolutely no idea what was in the warehouse at Christmas time. That's a, that's a retailer's nightmare. That's part of that living the dream that turns into a nightmare. Well, I called our COO. He was down at visiting stores in Arizona. I said, you've got to come and live in the warehouse until we get this figured out. We took two-fourths of our office, our accounting department, et cetera, and we moved them over to the warehouse. And back then, we had walkie-talkies and forklifts and... Excel spreadsheets instead of a, a very dynamic inventory management system that we should have had keeping track of what was there. It took us about three or four months after Christmas to figure out what we'd done. But we, got, we just physically got stuff in piles on trucks and out to the stores so it could be sold. It was, it was one of those nightmares. So in 2003, <clears throat> we continued to grow and got up to our 100 stores. That was my my dream, my goal, and we actually, to be honest, opened the last store about a week before we closed on the sale. But we hit that 100 stores. I didn't want 99, I wanted 100. Kind of like President Hinckley when he said he wanted over 100 temples, you know, that, that's where I was. I wanted to be there. 
that's, uh, that was our footprint where we, where we were. And it was interesting, during that process, the CEO of Dollar Tree came to visit me. And we became good friends. And he said, you know, we'd like to buy you. And I said, well, we're too small yet. We, we can't make a return that we want to make yet. And he says, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. We've got enough work we can do up here in the Northeast. We'll go work. We'll kind of stay out of each other's way for a little while. And we did that for about five years. And then it came together. But we didn't just let them come and buy us. We hired uh, one of the big uh, investment houses, uh, Swiss uh, Credit Suisse, to represent us. And by the way, I couldn't have got them on my own. We weren't big enough. But because our, our venture capital partner was big and, and uh, well-funded in New York, they could get the year and the, uh, get them to come and do it. And so they did, and they did a great job of it. And it actually came down to Albertsons and Dollar Tree in a horse race trying to buy it. And it was, it was a real interesting talk about this stress moments because Albertsons would have let us keep running it and the uh, Dollar Tree wouldn't. So I was trying to save jobs. I was trying to make it work for Albertsons. They didn't really understand the business. So we were trying to slow, slow down Dollar Tree and speed up Albertsons. It was, it was a nightmare during that time as well. And the right things happened. The frustrations that I felt during that time went away and the right things happened in the, in the sale of the company. Narchi came along before the sale even closed. One of our board members was the former CEO and chairman of Mervyn's, and he was helping this little company out down the Bay Area. Narchi is an Afrikaans word that means tangerine. So this company started, actually it happened to start the same year I started, 1989, in South Africa. The company has continued to grow, as was mentioned, we have stores all over the United States, South Africa, distribution in Canada, Saudi Arabia, and looking at other countries currently. And it's headquartered in Salt Lake City. And it's mostly being run by my former, C my, uh, former executives at the Greenbacks. They're good people. They knew this fashion industry as well as, as, as the uh, uh, small stores because of our stores. And uh, they've done a great job with it. Some of the things we do, and, and then one of the things that drew me to this is that there's a, all of our design team is in Cape Town, South Africa. And there's something about South Africa that, anybody here from South Africa? Nope, a couple other classes there has been. Uh, South Africa has an unpublished report of, of about 50% unemployment. And we have, we, we think we're in real trouble when we have 10%. And we are. It's not good for our economy. But can you imagine how creative those people have to be to live? That's why I, there's a lot of creativity in that country. <laughs> we love the design team that we have. They do a great job. But we wanted it to be comfortable. We wanted it to be wholesome. And we wanted it to be adventurous. Whimsical. So the, a lot of the little girl stuff has kind of a princessy kind of look to it. The boys have more an adventure, surfer, safari, you know, kind of uh, look to them. Good stuff. At the same time, as I was looking into to Narchi, my two partners came to me and I told you, said, we want you to come in. We need some, need you to, put some of the money you just made into this company and we need you to come and run it. I don't, I don't know how to run a sales-driven organization like that. So I did it for a while using just good business skills. We, I, when I came in, we had no business product. We had to rewrite the whole, the whole product, basically. And interestingly enough, I was too dumb to know it at the time, or too inexperienced in the industry, but we were the very first product to ever go to a... Uh, uh, to a subscription model. At the time, Adobe and all of the, the uh, McAfee and, and Symantec, everybody, were using an annual release that you would buy. And we went away, we were the first ones to say, okay, you pay your money and we'll continue to give you updates and you just pay an annual fee and it keeps you going. 
And then everybody started doing it. I think it was inspired. <laughs> I think it was a, a blessing for us. So today, uh, Net Nanny is our, our consumer product, and then Content Protect is the business product. Now, in this environment, I can say this. There's been a number of, we all know there's problems on the internet, right? There's pornography. There's gambling. There's lots of, lots of different problems. One of the biggest problems that we have in our country, in particular, is productivity. All of the independent studies that have shown that up to 30 to 40 percent of the average employee's day is spent on personal time on the internet. Now you as employees and you as entrepreneurs or business managers are going to be faced with this issue. How do you deal with it? It's a, it's a real thing. And then as my friend who was the CEO of Sam's Club found out that his CFO was into child pornography, you get some real serious issues that are translating from personal use into the business world. Our purpose for existence is to be able to allow the good things to happen that the, the internet was designed for. Not to take anything away from it in that regard, but to warn, allow, block all the other things based upon whatever, whatever the policy is for, that, for your family or for your company. How do you actually enforce that policy with software like this? We now have, we released last year a product for the Android and we're about 30 days away from having a product for the iPhone and iPad. And then there's other products coming behind that. President Hinckley, Elder Packer, and Elder Holland from the conference podium has said one of the things that everyone needs to do is to have filters on their computers. That's from a prophet of God. If you don't have one, whether it's Net Nanny or something else, please do it. The biggest issue we have in the church today is 50% of our young men and 30% of our women are involved in pornography. It's a real issue. And a lot of it's coming through the smartphones. We've got to pay attention to it. I can't think of another industry or product that, that God's given to us where rules and bounds haven't had to be set around its use. One of my favorite uh, analog analogies is, uh, is we call it the Internet Highway. How many can tell me how many cars existed on, in the United States in 1906? A little more than one. Not many, though. There was 500. And most of them were around New York City area, Chicago. There wasn't many. There were 100 miles of paved roads. That's all we had. And that's just over 100 years ago. Now, we have interstate freeways that didn't exist in Utah until I was in junior high. <laughs> I had to drive from Payson to Salt Lake on Highway 89 to go visit my aunts and uncles. How many have, have been into parts of Africa and China, India, some of the third world countries? What's the traffic like there? I've been in all those places. In Nigeria, my parents served two missions there, and there was sometimes bodies just left lying on the side of the road. They don't care what side of the road they drive on. Yeah, there's rules, but you just drive where you want to drive. And in rural China, India, that's the way things happen too. Because we have developed the rules and bounds around traffic and the use of vehicles, we have an efficient distribution system with trucks, 
We have buses, we have cars, we have the ability to use it for good. And there's still people who use it for bad. Yes. Oh, five minutes? Okay. All right. I'm going to go from there. I'm going to get to here. This is a principle that has made a big difference in our businesses and in our lives. And I think it's part of the responsibility that we have coming from a Latter-day Saint school. And that is giving back. Some of the statistical analysis around matching up charities to businesses is that about, it's in the 86% uh, range of people who will change retailers to those who will provide a charitable service if they like it. They'll change who they shop from. And there's, there's a, uh, in employees, it's in the 80% range of employees that are happy to work at an organization versus about 60% who don't have a charitable tie. If I say the word cause marketing, or who can tell me the difference between cause marketing and cause related marketing? Anybody? Typical answer. <laughs> Cause, causes are like uh, Make-A-Wish, Big Brother, Big Sister, etc. Those are the causes. And if you're marketing those causes, you're marketing the business of that cause. <clears throat> but a cause-related marketing is when you can match up a cause and a, and a nonprofit and bring them together and you get value at the bottom line by doing that. We looked around and started the Single Mom Foundation. It had a couple of different names. But it, it was because we had about 15% of our customer was a single mom in need of the things that we had. We also employed a lot of single moms. And we even worked with companies that were started by single moms entrepreneurially. It was an issue that was not being addressed. We couldn't find it addressed anywhere. So we started it from scratch. I like to call it, instead of the Steve Covey win-win, I think it's a win-win-win when, when these things happen. The organization wins. Some of the things that I was telling you about the companies. Let me talk to you just a second about goodwill. Goodwill in the community. Do companies make mistakes? Yeah. We had a store in Price, Utah that caught on fire. We were never open on Sunday. It started on fire on Easter Sunday. A sign was left on. It was filled with just black, acrid, chemical-type smoke. We had to shut the store down for about three months, four months, to get it all completely cleaned out, repainted, re, uh, refixtured, and re... Uh, Remerchandised. During that time, I told our employees, you're not on vacation. <clears throat> we don't have anything for you here. We had good insurance that were covering their salaries. They said, you pick the charity, but you go out and serve the same number of hours in that charity that you would have worked at the store. At the end of those three months, they came back to work. The store opened and did 30% better than it did when it closed. We had goodwill in that community because a few months later, I get a phone call from a woman. She said, we were watching one of your cartoons back in VHS tape days. These were some cartoons that were on those tapes we'd sold in the store. She said, I was watching with my child, and at the end of, the, end of it, we, went, we were sitting there for a minute, we went to turn it off, and all of a sudden, porno pornography started playing. I go, what the heck? We found out our supplier was using used pornography tapes and, and supposed to be wiping them out, but hadn't got it all off. I mean, they could have easily gone to the government, to the FBI, the police, wherever they called us. They knew that's not the kind of people we were. And we said, what can we help you with? Well, we'd like some counseling. We said, absolutely. Arrange it. We'll pay for it. It worked. Stakeholders. All of the stakeholders in an organization become winners when this happens. Charities and the individuals with the need all win. 
So this is my, my philosophy. Who cares is who wins. If you care about your commitments and covenants, if you care about your neighbor, if you care about your employees, if you care about the quality of the goods that you provide and services, you'll win. There's no question. Now, I, I guess we're going to a question and answer period separate from here, but folks, it's been great to be with you, as it always is. Thank you.